We're joined now by Michael Hoey, the Managing Director of Country Crest. Michael, we're delighted you could pop into Thanks, us Sarah. for a quick chat. Um, so, Michael, can we just start off maybe by talking about Country Crest? And okay. you developed this business from very small scale, fresh potato farm business into a major food producing company. Um, Where did it all start? I suppose it started probably, Claire, 40 years ago when um, I left school at the age of 15 and uh, on a very small vegetable farm, my brother and I, um, my dad wanted one of us to go and get a trade. He said there wasn't enough of work for both of us to stay on the 50 acre farm. But all we really wanted to do was to grow vegetables and to, um, you know, to work really at home. And, and we loved the idea of farming and and machinery and whatever else, like any young boy deals. And uh, I suppose we got the opportunity to start renting some uh, land and to, um, and basically it was working around the clock, hard work. Um, and I suppose things were, there was more opportunities there then. Things were tougher out there because nobody really had any money and there was recessions like we've seen in the past number of years, but expectations were much lower. And you had a consumer base that were consuming Irish food and their choice was much less. So you had a market opportunity. And that continued for a couple of years or for a few years. And we could see that there was, <clears throat> there was huge gaps in quality. The consumer was being asked to buy things that they shouldn't really have been doing. Quality was poor in a lot of cases. And we saw that there was an opportunity if we were to improve quality, put our name behind it, that the consumers would come back and the customers would come back and buy from us. And that continued for a number of years. And then I suppose supermarkets were starting to grow at that time. Um, and we were there at the beginning of that. And then in the potato industry in the 80s, the Irish potato season ran typically from the 1st of June until St. Patrick's Day. So there was a gap of three months or three and a half months there that was completely serviced by um, imported potatoes. And at that time, I suppose the consumption of fresh potatoes in Ireland was about 8,000 tonnes a week and today it's four and a half thousand tons. So the market was much bigger at that time. And then the washing of potatoes came in in the late 80s as well. And ourselves along with Denigans and Kyo's were the first ones to wash potatoes in Ireland. And that gave us, I suppose, another platform to, to differentiate ourselves. And I suppose it's always looking for how you can differentiate yourself from your competition because the market out there is very tough and it always has been, it probably always will be. But it's just trying to do things better than your competition is and uh, give the consumer something that um, they don't already have. And that means that you have to keep researching your customer base, keep asking them what they want, what, what they would like to consume and then you go about how you're going to fulfill their requirements or their ambitions. What about the challenges you faced along the way over those 26 years, yeah. I believe? Um, what are some of the biggest challenges that you had to overcome and persevere? Uh, I suppose there's always been challenges. Um, but I suppose the biggest one has been interest rates and availability of money. Always been trying to um, convince banks first of all to give you some money and and then um, after that in the in the early 90s we went through horrendous interest rates and that was when our accountants advised us it was time to form a company and stop being sole traders as such because the risk was too great and I remember one night in 1993 the interest rates went to 28 percent and I know to people today that sounds ridiculous, but it was actually what you were fighting with at that time. 
So that hampered your growth as such, and at that time you wouldn't really borrow that much money. You were trying to reinvest everything that you could make from it, and you were trying to do multiple jobs. And I see a lot of young people today who are trying to build food companies, and the same thing is happening to them. And that is that they're trying to do everything. They're, they're manufacturing food during the week. They're trying to do their compliance work at night time. They're doing the deliveries early in the morning. And then all the book work is there on a Sunday. And they get worn out from it. They don't have time. The life balance is completely wrong. So it's something that needs to be avoided. But can you expand on that there, the, the work-life balance? Like what's the impact of, of that being out of kilter? I suppose um, my family are here today and whatever else. Uh, it's a huge sacrifice to build an agribusiness or to build any business because it takes every hour you've got and especially you don't see it when your children are small or whatever else. You don't see that you probably neglect them and you neglect your wife or husband or whoever it is in that time and you give a huge amount of your life to, to actually build and uh, putting in the foundations properly first of all and then building it and then I suppose one of the real keys is to be able to identify talent, to be identify people who are better than yourself in different areas and, and then to, to put them in place and give them the responsibility. Um, I heard you speak at a conference out in Kentucky there um, a few months ago, Michael, and you mentioned, you spoke as well about the, the horse meat scandal and the impact that that had on yeah. your business. Can you maybe uh, tell us about that, what happened? Well, I suppose um, part of our business, we make meals and meal um, solutions. And <clears throat> that business was building quite well um, over to, from 2008 on. And I remember the week before the horse meat crisis in uh, January 2013, and I, I remember <clears throat> that week we made 159,000 meals that week, and, and the following week it dropped into the low 60,000s. So we halved our business in one week, and it was a, a dreadful place to be, very much like the meat crisis is today. And we were faced, our auditors were telling us we needed to close that business. Ireland was in a huge recession at that time. It's only six years ago. And we had just over 200 people working on that side of the business. And I, I said, I cannot put one of those people out of a job. They have to be looked after. Each one of them has a mortgage. They have a family, whatever else. We need to find a solution to this. And <clears throat> what it meant was we had to go back to the drawing board again. Uh, thank God we had nothing to do with the horse meat crowd. We had no inferior products in that. The department officials came in, they took away samples, they took lots of things. But we were relying on the meat industry um, telling us that everything was true, everything was right. We were using all Irish beef. Um, so, as I said, we had nothing wrong there. But what we actually did was we went and we reformed how we made the meals. We went from long shelf life products back to very short shelf life products, making them very much like our customers do at home in their own kitchen. And also, we were going to bring our beef, when we were growing up we had beef cattle on the farm, and we brought the beef herd back onto the farm again and uh, we built a, a new unit for, for fattening the heifers. And that gave us, um, if something was to go wrong again, that we had the credibility of that beef going into the meals as such. And also from like-minded producers that would feed into, into our same beef requirement. And bit by bit, we built that business back up and today it's it's producing about 300,000 meals a week. So, uh, but it's, it's a tough industry, yeah. You strike me, Michael, as someone who, um, who faces, if there's a crisis in the industry, if you're facing, you're yeah. facing the crisis 
head on you have um, to. and identify solutions and then follow through mm. on them. And you just touched on the crisis in the meat industry mm. and the beef side. Um, what your can you offer any advice there? I suppose to the primary producer who is seriously yeah. suffering on the ground right now. Absolutely. And trust is a big problem. Yeah. We have, yeah, I'm sure you're aware of the agreement that is there on the mm. table that the farm organisations are trying to mm. to uh, talk to those that are still on, still on the picket line. Uh, but there's a lack of trust there that the maybe that the processor will follow through on those commitments. Yeah. But what advice would you give to that to the, the primary ch producers there who are who are facing that crisis in the midst of that crisis right now first of all Claire it's a very sad situation we're in at the minute and it's a sad situation for a couple of reasons first one is in my opinion food is too cheap today and um, there has been a situation over the last number of years where food was a, our commodities like beef and grain everything else was as expensive 25 years ago as it is today. And the producer, or the primary producer out there, has so many compliance issues today. All the costs have been moving up all the time from wages to insurance costs to everything else. And I don't believe any farmer wants to be on a picket line. And they're in a desperate situation to get a fix. And I think it's ridiculous, first of all, that people go to negotiate things and they can't talk about the price when the price is the real issue that's out there. It's the base price that is the problem. And if the primary producer cannot get enough money to produce that product and to make a living from it, well, how can they continue to do it? And, and I think the meat industry people are being very unfair. Um, they need to understand that their living is coming from the primary producer out there. They need to understand the crisis that they're in at the minute. They need to pay them properly and, and then to move on with this. Because if it's not fixed, it's just getting worse and worse. And as you said, the trust has gone away from everybody. And we need, I would appeal to the, to the meat factory owners out there, just go and fix this. Please go and fix it and pay people a proper price for what they're doing. Bonuses and all those things are great things to have if you have the base price proper. And that needs to be fixed. And, and I know that in our industry, in the potato industry, in the vegetable industry, we face the same thing. We face uh, contracting consumption. Um, the discounter supermarkets targeted uh, the price is selling vegetables for way below cost and all this and it has driven people out of our industry. There's very few left in the vegetable or in that industry anymore because they can't afford to be in it. And it's a very sad situation that we're at this crossroads again in the meat industry and, and it needs, please, it needs to be fixed and it can be fixed. It's something I think can be fixed. Very valid points, Michael. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, and just finally, Michael, which is a short show we have here today, um, but you're also an avid collector of uh, classic, classic tractors. I understand uh, Massey's and, and Ford's. Can you just tell us about that that interest of yours, that hobby on the side? Jenny, I don't. Know. It's um, it's a diversification, really. I suppose you need some sort of thing to to um, have some sort of diversion. And, and that has been mine, and I suppose I've met some fantastic people through the years, both across Ireland and Europe in that whole space, and there's no real competition in it. And uh, it's a great place to be able to, um, to, you know, to have a hobby. And yeah, tell uh, us about your collection, what you, what you have. Well, I suppose we've been building it for 23 years now, and, um, We've been able to, I suppose, with, with my family and whatever else, to, to have charity events and to, to raise money for different needy causes and whatever else. And uh, we're fortunate enough to have it. And um, hopefully we can continue to, to give people enjoyment from it. So. 
Michael, unfortunately that's all we have time for, but thank you so much for, for coming into us today and we hope you enjoy the rest of the day out at the ploughing. Thanks very much, Claire. Okay, and we'll go back around the site now.